I'm going to spend about half an hour, I guess, um, give you a quick introduction. It's not only fair to do that. Agree some terms. And I want to talk about two very distinct things, consumer 3D printing and industrial additive manufacturing. And Carl Bass kind of touched on this a little bit in the last session. We think these are two completely separate areas of business, two totally different value chains, two totally different revenue streams. And I want to try and talk about these two things very separately with you, because I think the consumer electronics industry is one of the few industries that can actually exploit both of these two potential revenue areas. Um, so we'll talk about the realities, the opportunities in the 3DP consumer space. I'm going to talk about some supply chain benefits, technology developments as well that are driving supply chain change. Um, and then we'll have a summary at the end, maybe some takeaways for you to kind of go away and ruminate over as you, you wander around in the next couple of days. So as way of introduction, um, Econlist, which is the company I run, based over in the UK, um, we've been active in the kind of 3D printing additive space for about 13 years now, 14 years. Um, many of the people are kind of dinosaurs in additive for the last 20 years or so, but we're a kind of eclectic mix of people now. Yes, we have people with lots of experience in additive, but what we realized is to make this really fly, you have to bring in people who understand retail, who understand HR, who understand what happened if you put manufacturing technologies in retail environments. What does it do to people? We have economists who work out the economics, the break even of whether you use this tech rather than traditional tech to make tangible products. Most of our work is, is pretty global, and, and we kind of do pride ourselves on having a relatively Fortune 500 client base. What we do is spend a lot of time ideating new, new products and new services, new ideas for where this 3D printing concept or the additive manufacturing concept can bring something to market that is new or it can change the way a supply chain operates. Uh, whether that is a supply chain in aerospace or automotive, consumer electronics, consumer goods, it really doesn't matter. Um, we spend a fair bit of our time working with the people who make these machines, with the software vendors, the hardware vendors, the materials companies, trying to help them understand how this industry is evolving so that they can bring to market technologies that are actually fit for purpose. Because bear no bones about it, we are still trying to shoehorn prototyping technologies into production applications. And that's not really where we want to be. So there's still a lot of tech space that needs developing. Um, and we do a fair bit of work with, with the, the financial service sector on an advisory capacity. It's not what we're here for. We're here to talk about additive manufacturing and 3D printing in your world, in the consumer electronics sector. This isn't an aerospace conference. It's not a medical conference. It's a CE event. So let's try and focus it around that consumer electronics space as best we can. So I said we should kind of start with some, some terminology. In, in our world, this idea of 3D printing and manufacturing, are they the same? They're used interchangeably by the media. Um, but quite often, nobody really looks under the surface and says, is it the same thing? We don't think it is. We think they are two very, very separate entities. 3D printing to us is typically associated with people, consumers, making at home or making in their communities or making in school. What it is is taking a technology and giving it to people who are not ordinarily makers in a supply chain and then ensuring that they have raw material and data to put that into the technology they have to allow them to make tangible products. That's 3D printing. Additive manufacturing is an industrial process. It sits in a supply chain. It sits in a classical business model. It sits in a model that revolves around designing and prototyping a product at the front end, marketing a product, making a product, filling a supply chain, ensuring that you have wholesale, retail, and a route to market. That's additive manufacturing. You may have displaced a process like injection molding or CNC machining or casting. That's what AM is. They're two very separate things, but they both present business opportunities, but in very, very different ways. The commonality, of course, is they both make things layer by layer digitally. That's, that's the common thread here. It's making things layer by layer by layer. So I guess at this point, you know, we have to ask ourselves, why should that matter to you guys? You're not necessarily making hip implants. You're not making aerospace wing components that need to be lightweight. You're not making high-performance wishbones off motorbikes. You're engaged in an industry that fundamentally is bringing electronics to the masses. So why does this matter? I think it, it matters because you're one of the few industries that actually crosses the whole area of 3D printing in the consumer environment and industrial additive manufacturing. And you can benefit from both sides of that equation. Aerospace can't. Aerospace is still grappling with the idea of using industrial additive technologies in their classical supply chains. You know, they're then hypothesizing that one day maybe their customers will print parts locally. 
but that's still within a classical manufacturing supply chain. Will we ever get to one day when the guy takes his light aircraft and fixes it himself with a machine that sits in his home workshop? That's a long way off. That's a long, long way off. Similarly, you know, automotive. We really struggle with the automotive industry. When you break it down, there are very few compelling business reasons why an automotive company would ever want to additively manufacture things. It's all about modularization within automotive. Very, very high volumes. Yeah? Applying multiple component parts to multiple vehicles. If you take medical, there are a few very early examples of where consumer 3D printing is being used to make medical parts. But most of it is industrial anti-manufacturing. So most industries can't exploit both sides of this, this opportunity space, but we think maybe consumer electronics can. So I guess what I'd like to do is, is give you a bit more of a, a flavor of, of how we see this e the ecosystem of these two things emerging. Um, and then I'll, I'll try and flavor that with some case studies and some, some examples. So if you think of these two things as being almost diametrically opposed to each other, they, they share common technology. You have additive manufacturing. It's a technology used by manufacturers. It's used within a retail environment. It's used by brands. And at the other side of this equation, you have 3D printing. It's used by consumers. And what you have is really a, a situation where at one end, you have companies that make everything. Everything they do is tangible. And then they sell those tangible objects to consumers. And these are consumers that buy everything. They're not makers. And then at the other end of the scale in our ecosystem, you have companies who don't make anything. They vend and retail digital data to consumers who make everything. And then in between, we have this myriad of different consumers and different manufacturing organizations who some make, some don't, some vend data, some don't. Some consumers engage in the design process, some consumers don't. And what you have in the middle is a situation where you have additive manufacturing at one end and 3D printing at the other, where things are being made in companies, or they're being made by service bureaus, or they're being made by local hubs, or they're being made in the home. And that's where the opportunity space lies for consumer electronics, at this interface. So what I want to do is just give you a few uh, examples um, of this. And, and I think first off, let's explore the consumer 3D printing space. Because, you know, 3D printing has been at CES for what, two years, three years? And I think a lot of the growth and the drive and the number of vendors upstairs is probably around this belief, uh, as we've already heard earlier this morning, that, you know, everybody will have a 3D printing machine. And, and therefore, obviously, the consumer electronics industry needs to take note of this. It could be this huge new revenue stream for you. 7.2 billion people, therefore 7.2 billion 3D printers, right? Yeah, it's, it's simple, yeah? Well, there is an awful lot of hype, and yes, you can track it back. You know, my f three favorite comments, I think, were Abe with his, it will be bigger than the internet. Uh, Cody with his, a new world order, we'll all be printing firearms, and, and Breeze, you can print anything, which are clearly not really true statements. Um, I, I, as a consultancy, we love to use data and economics and statistics to prove things. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to debunk the bigger than the internet. That's how big 3D printing is compared to the internet. You've all missed it, haven't you? Okay. There it is. Um, it actually represents about 0.0002% penetration compared to the internet. Now, that's okay, but you could look at it and say, well, there's a huge opportunity space. There's an awful lot of gray on the map. Um, we have a little... Uh, rule of thumb in the office, and, and if, you, if you're bored for a couple of hours, which I doubt you will be in Vegas, but if you ever become bored on a, in the office and you've got a couple of hours to kill, go through LinkedIn, go through Facebook, look at the profiles of people you know, and I bet your bottom dollar, and you shouldn't say that in Vegas, but I bet that you will find one in 200 people who are engaged in some sort of pastime, hobby, economic activity, i.e. they do some work at the weekend, make things and sell them on Etsy. One in 200 that will benefit from a 3D printer. Okay, 7.5% of the world's population are in the G8. That's where the wealth is. 49% are in the G20. That's where the next level of wealth is. Extrapolate that through. 2.6 million people potentially in G8 countries based on our 1 to 200. And that's based on today's tech. Now, that 1 to 200 probably will come down to 1 in 180, 150, 100 as the technology finds new niches and new applications. But it's a significant opportunity space. You know, so we have, what, 13% penetration today in the G8. We have less than, what, 1.1% penetration across the G20. 
Okay, so the skeptics are going to say, okay, well, that's fair enough, Phil, but there are barriers, yeah? We've heard this, there are barriers. Machines are too expensive. They're too expensive for consumers. Uh, poor quality printing, materials are limited. Uh, there's nothing you can print yet. What are you going to print? There's, there's nothing with value. Machines are aimed at experts. They're not aimed at consumers. We heard this, uh, one of the questions from the floor earlier. You know, privacy will prevent valuable IP. Uh, will data ever become available that's valuable to the consumer? Um, well, let's look at it in the, uh, the current state that we're in today. 3D printers are actually cheaper than Xboxes. Yeah? Go to the Micro 3D website and you'll find a 3D printer for 349 bucks. That's assembled. That's powered off USB. That plugs directly into your USB 3 port. That's where we are in terms of accessibility to consumers. Um, if you're a little bit more techie savvy, there's something called the Peachy printer, which you'll have to assemble yourself. That's 99 bucks. Okay? So we're no longer in the domain of even the $1,000 realm that we were in a year ago or two years ago. Things are coming down. 3D printing is finding applications for consumers. There is more and more content on the web that is desirable to people, whether it's protected, whether it's behind different uh, Creative Commons licenses for use and exploitation. But there is useful data out there that people are downloading and they are printing. In terms of the question about are machines consumer ready, you know, we're seeing some pretty impressive leaps and, and bounds with some of the tech. You know, machines are becoming Internet of Things devices, which is where they need to be. They need to be self-diagnosing. They need to be self-healing. They need to be self-updating. They need to have feedback mechanisms in them that feed back to the data you're trying to link onto them. You know, so if you take some of the MakerBot kit and look at it, you know, you've got material supply monitoring, performance monitoring, online control tools for using web-based devices. This is making it consumer-ready, taking it out of the hands of the, the maker and putting it more into the consumer. In terms of data and, and the comment earlier about IP, you know, one of the other things that we're seeing now is this concept of streaming, which makes perfect sense. You know, the reason the film industry and the music industry struggled for so long with developing sustainable revenue streams was that they didn't have the benefit of 24-7 broadband connectivity. So 10 years ago, we were downloading things and storing them to hard drives so we could watch them later. Now we don't. We go on Netflix. You know, we go on, on Amazon Player. We go on Spotify. That's how we access what we want, which is the music. You know, what we actually want is a movement of analog um, airwaves into our ears. What we don't want is a digital file. That's just the enabler. And with 3D printing, the STL file is the enabler. You don't want it. If you're a consumer, you want a tangible product. So streaming data to printers gets away from those problems about intellectual property and theft and, and, and IP infringement. So again, that's where we're seeing. That's the state of the art in terms of getting that data to the consumer. The other thing that we're seeing, which I think we'll hear a lot about later from Bram from 3D Hubs, is the idea that communities themselves are becoming manufacturing supply chains. So yes, you may not be the person with the 3D printer. You may not feel that you need one in your, in your home, but someone in your street might. And there are already networks evolving that we'll hear a lot about later that allow communities to become part of that supply chain environment. So that's what's kind of happening. So I suppose, you know, at this point, pause and think, does that align to any of your customers? Does it align to any of the products you make or the services or the markets that you work in? Is there a way that you can you know, augment your products? I don't know what you make. But if you think long and hard about it, is there something you can do to extend the value or the life of the products that you have by putting data in the hands of consumers to augment the products? That's where 3D printing provides a revenue stream to companies. It isn't just about making the printers. It's about feeding the data to the consumers that use the printers. It's about making yourself sticky using 3D printing. So let's explore industrial additive manufacturing, the other side of this, using this within supply chains. You know, why does anybody want to do that? Casting's been around for 6,000 years. Machining's been around for, well, CNC machining's been around, what, 60 years now. You know, making things subtractively has been around for about two and a half million years. You know, Stone Age Man was doing it. That's basically what we do today. We take blocks of material and we hit them with machines and we form them into other shapes or we cast them, we melt metal, or we take an injection mold tool and we squeeze molten plastic into it and we let it solidify. What's wrong with that? Why doesn't it work? Why do you want to change the way you make things? And I think when you look at industrial additive manufacturing, it's because it appeals across the supply chain. The business benefits are quite pervasive. You start, obviously, with the economic low volume production argument. If you're not constrained by tooling and investment in fixed assets at the front of a supply chain, 
It opens up opportunity for lower volumes. It enables true product personalization. Unit volumes of one, individual consumers. High geometric freedom and complexity. We saw some beautiful examples in, in, in the previous presentation about that. If you're not constrained by traditional manufacturing approaches, if you're making things particle by particle, layer by layer, you can make very complex things. That then allows you to make really functional things. The heat exchanger was a great example earlier. What wasn't mentioned so much about the heat exchanger was it wasn't about the shape, it was about the functionality. What you had there was a heat exchanger with a significantly larger surface facing area than a traditional heat exchanger. It's a more functional object. That's why that would find its way into a supply chain, not just because it's a funky shape. Obviously, retail and marketing models can change. We can think about doing things in a very different way. Shortening supply chains, which has obvious benefits in terms of, of uh, the number of turnover of product iterations, faster time to market, less waste, transportation. Lots of arguments about whether this additive approach is truly green or not. And we can, we can go on for days about that. But there are potentials to green supply chains as well using additive technology. So in the consumer electronic space, you know, low volume production, there's some great examples where a number of these things are being pulled together. You know, some of uh, Olaf Deagle's guitars are a great example. Very low volume, very high value, incredible geometric complexity. That's what wins the customer over to buying that product. But interestingly, the supply chains are different. The things are made to order. They're printed when you've paid. It's a great flip over of the traditional supply chain. You know, we're seeing things like even uh, headphones uh, being manufactured where the shells of these things, high geometric complexity, um, but made by additive manufacturing technologies. The other area, of course, you know, wearables is a big thing here uh, this year. Additive lends itself so beautifully to the idea of wearables because it allows us to personalize things to individual body shapes. And we're starting to see that really coming out of fashion. And a few years ago, I think a lot of us were thinking, why the hell is the fashion industry so excited about 3D printing? Um, I still struggle sometimes with mainstream fashion and 3D printing, but what it has done is it's shown us how we can build quite robust value chains to take consumers, scan them, and build products that use the geometric data of those people. So a really nice example of this, um, which we saw recently, is some guys uh, with a company called uh, Normal. Um, and what they're doing is basically making headphones, but using your geometry from your own ear. Um, and you think, well, okay, you need some pretty high-end scanning technology to do that. No, you don't. We've heard about this already, cloud-based tools, cloud-based processing. Yeah? I can take photographs with my iPhone. I can upload them to the cloud as 30 or 40 shots and have 3D data extracted from that. That can be used to drive the process. What you, what you probably didn't see there was they were holding a reference next to the ear. We've seen this done before with glasses, frames for glasses that are 3D printed, where you hold a credit card on your nose and take a photo side on and a photo front on with a credit card by your ear. All credit cards are the same size. All of a sudden we have an engineering datum. From that we can extract data about the consumer. We can make a product that fits. So that's kind of where things are going in terms of, of taking consumer shape and using the shape uh, to specify the product. The other thing we're then seeing is extending that to letting consumers be the designer. So this is an augmentation of that product. And this is really quite interesting. This is turning in-ear headphones, earbuds, into jewelry. So what is that? Is that a new class of jewelry? People have been hanging things on their ear lobes for thousands of years, but they haven't been stuffing jewelry in their ears. But all of a sudden, we now have things that are stuffed in our ears all the time. And here, we're turning those into jewelry. So again, a new business that emerges kind of from the tech. Um, the idea here, though, is that the consumer, through HTML5 and web tools, can go online and be part of the design experience. So the consumer uses their data from their ear canal, and they then go online and design the thing they want on the outside of it. That's where the value of this comes, because that's wholly enabled by additive manufacturing. Functionality. Um, I mentioned about functionality, and I thought I'd put this in. This is really interesting. We've done research on this for probably, I guess, six or seven years now. The idea that you could use additive manufacturing to change other functions. Um, and this is a great example. It's, it's nothing that, that we've had any involvement with, but I think it's, it's a beautiful example. Um, when you look at speakers, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a hi-fi nerd. I'll put my hands up. It's probably not a bad environment to be a hi-fi nerd in. You look at speakers, most speakers are suboptimally designed. Yeah, they're designed to either have an aesthetic on the outside or they're designed to fit within a space. If you actually look at what makes a perfect speaker in terms of an amplifier, it isn't what you buy even in a high-end hi-fi shop. 
Yeah? Reverse engineer this out. Use some of those Autodesk type tools and think about the function being the proliferation of sound waves. What is the perfect speaker? What is the perfect amplification system for a sound wave? And how can you then get that to the listener? Can you make that shape additively? That's functional additive manufacturing. It's taking geometric complexity and increasing the value proposition of the product that you make. Um, a company we are working with at the moment, some, some great guys, um, that's the 3D printer, them, Chris and Joe. Um, and these are the guys behind Chilingo, who are the publishers of Angry Birds. These guys understand licensing and IP. Um, and they have a new company called Things 3D. And what they're doing with Things 3D is, is taking existing IPs and existing brands and then printing them, similar to something Carl showed us actually, where they were, they were dropping electronics in. What these guys do is drop RFID into the 3D printed objects and then link that RFID back into the web to take the owner of the 3D product into a new immersive environment that you can't get to without the product. But what you can also do is then trade these things. So there are online platforms to trade collectibles that are 3D printed collectibles. So again, it's not just a dumb piece of plastic molding. It's a much more intelligent piece of, of engineering. Um, the other benefit we hear a lot about is this idea that you know, if we have additive manufacturing, we can reorder our supply chains. We can take manufacturing, mass manufacturing away from Asian economies, bring it back to high wage economies. Um, you know, the idea that we go from global to continental to national to local. I, I don't buy that as uh, additive manufacturing as a standalone technology. It simply won't work. And the reason for that is that most products you have in your pocket, on this desk, are systems. They're not individual pieces of plastic. They are assemblies of multiple components made from multiple materials using multiple manufacturing technologies. So if you put an additive machine in 17 different places, you still need 17 sets of supply chains. You still need to bring 17 sets of component parts together. And when you do the math, the economics quite often falls over. And all of a sudden, the centralized factory makes a lot more sense. And then you look at it from an environmental perspective. Oh, all of a sudden, the centralized factory makes more sense. So it's not as cut and dry. We think the change in the future will come when you have different configurations where things like additive technologies are melded together with things like open source hardware, robotics, open source software, where you have the ability to have much more uh, responsive factory configurations. So we, we were very lucky last year and the year before to test this hypothesis with IBM. Um, and we looked at five consumer uh, electronics products, if you, if you class a washing machine as a CE product, I'm not sure. Um, and the idea here was we took things over a range of scales and a range of complexities. So if you look at a, a modern in-ear hearing aid, this is a thing with Bluetooth embedded in it. It's $2,000. It's highly complex in terms of its, um, uh, its electronic capability, but it's a really simple piece of engineering. It's a piece of plastic, and it's already 3D printed. 12 million of these things are 3D printed every year. At the other end of the scale, you have a pretty big, bulky lump. We had a Samsung Industrial TV, we had a Philips Razor, we had an iPhone. And what we did on these was we did some teardowns, as you do, which is always good fun. Um, and in some cases, it was more fun than others. Just, just as, a, as a sidebar, this was delivered to our office, and it came when we, we bought it online, and, and it came with installation, and the guy came with his spanner, and he went, where's your water? And we said, I don't want water near it. Don't put water anywhere near it, it'll ruin the carpet. You know, we want this as dry as we can. So, so what you do, you know, you go through these things, and all of a sudden, you start to get a little bit demoralized because you realize that the 3D printing candidates, or the additive manufacturing candidates, are not as many as you'd think. You know, are we really going to make pressed steel components by additive manufacturing? Mm. Are we really going to make electric motors with wound cores? Are we going to make solenoids? Are we going to make some of the water valves? Mm, maybe. You know, what are we actually going to make? Where does the economies of scale or the need to, to customize or personalize actually drive us down the chain? Um, then what you discover is that the vendors don't want to give you the CAD data, so you have to get someone in the office to reverse engineer it, uh, which makes them very unhappy. Um, and then you stuff it through some modeling tools. And we have a lot of modeling tools in the office that let us look at things like optimum orientation, best way to build things, selection processes for, for additive. Um, what we also did was some interesting forecasting, some future forecasting. So we looked at things like IP. What happens when IP ex expires? How will that change the market, if at all? What happens to material costs? As volumes go up, will the material cost of additive come down? Hardware cost. Now, how will changes in, the, in the, the marketplace change hardware cost? The other thing's productivity. As Carl said earlier, additive machines are heinously slow. You know, we used to call this rapid manufacturing until someone pointed out it wasn't rapid. 
Um, it's now additive manufacturing. It is slow. As a piece part production process, it is slow. But that, that speed is, is justified by things like laser power and scan speed. It's justified by things like print head capacity, number of DPI. And all those things are changing. Um, and what you can do is you can take all of that information and you can then look at it in terms of productivity. So how much more productive could additive manufacturing be? And if you take that industrial LCD TV, it's interesting. The bill of materials was about 1,200 pounds, or dollars, sorry. Now, bear in mind this was two years ago. Um, when you did a teardown, you discovered that only $25 of the parts could actually be 3D printed or additively manufactured. The vast majority of it is electronics. It's the screen. It's the systems. It's the IC. It's the amplifier chips. That's where the value in the bomb is. It's not in the plastic components. It's not in the metal brackets. But what you do find is that when you then start looking at redesigning things to make them additively or redesigning them to have them assembled by robotics, um, you get into a different space. So you get into a point where all of a sudden your, uh, your $1,500 of AM cost comes down to $23. Uh, of course, then people chuck things in the mix that you weren't expecting, so thanks, Scott. Um, and you get things like HP making announcements of tenfold increases in productivity and a reduction in costs. Oh, hang on a minute, what does that do? Well, all of a sudden what it does is it accelerates that reduction in piece part price. It brings more volume manufacture closer to us. So, you know, there are developments in this industry. You have to keep watching the industry all the time. Just to finish off, it's probably worth pointing on some other things. AM 2.0, a rise of intelligent stuff. Um, what do we mean by this? Well, we know we can already kind of print to some degree a level of intelligence. We can make multi-material things at the moment. We can print color, elasticity, strength. Um, we can also look at 2D printed electronics. We can print circuits very easily. They're, you know, they're, they're banged off on by the roll at the moment. 2.0 is about multifunctional printing, bringing all this together. You know, there's work printing batteries and printing sensors and printing circuits and printing optics. If you then put that into some of these forward-looking models, you get some quite interesting changes. If you look at the, um, uh, the hearing aid that we looked at, you know, the bill of materials there uh, is about $313. $3 of that is the additive manufactured shell. $313 is the electronics. But it's actually quite, although it's quite complex in terms of the IC, the amplifier chip, the battery, uh, the switching systems, the wiring are not complex. And in 10 years' time, we will be printing those. And what that then does is it has a significant impact on the bill of materials for that product. So what was a $300 bill of materials basically comes down almost by two-thirds. So that's where the industry is being driven. So again, let's pause and, and just say, would any of those benefits actually help you guys in the things you make today or in the near future? You know, coming back to this, I genuinely think if you look at this on a, a pretty loose scale here, at the moment, yes, the medical sector is the predominant user of additive technologies. Whether that's for dental implants or hip implants or knees or whether it's cutting guides or whether it's orthotic insoles or whether it's prosthetic parts. Lots and lots and lots of examples. That is the early adopter at the moment. And that adoption will grow. Consumer goods is starting to adopt this, you know, making things directly for the consumer. I think the next one is consumer electronics through the augmentation of products or by embedding this manufacturing philosophy into a supply chain. Aerospace will no doubt be a huge user of additive, but it will take a number of years, as we've heard, because of largely legislative issues or regulatory issues, but also because of what are called programs. Go and talk to Boeing, go and talk to Airbus. You know, their product development cycle is 25 years. And when they lay down a supply chain, that supply chain is laid down years before the first part's made. So if you're talking about trying to get additive parts into aerospace, Start looking at programs that are years out into the future, because that's where it will happen. And automotive, again, it's, we don't ever see that as being a significant user of these technologies. So just to, to wrap all of this up, to summarize, um, on the consumer side of things, it will continue to grow. It, it is overhyped, I genuinely believe that, but it's not a flash in the pan. It's not going to disappear. And growth will be driven by technology development, Internet of Things enablement, accessibility to more desirable content. I have a good, a good friend who at the moment calls it shishi. Why do you want to print this shishi in the home? It has no value. Okay, but we will find value and we will find content. Um, opportunities will emerge, I think, to sell both hardware, and we, we can see that there is obviously hardware growth, but also data, this idea of freeing data up and making data available for people to print at home. In terms of industrial AM, piece part price will drop, and it will drop significantly. Making polymer component parts will come down in price. 
um, it will be more cost effective for higher unit volumes. Materials will increase in quality, uh, they'll increase in, in, in terms of options. Bear in mind at the moment, everything we make additively is using materials that were developed for other processes. They were developed for injection molding, they were developed for investment casting. We're only now at the point where we're starting to look at additive processes and saying, well, why isn't the additive process making its own material? Why is it using a material that was formulated for a different process? And when we start thinking in that mindset, then we will get better quality from the things that we make. Um, the other thing I think is going to drive a lot of consumer 3D printing and the interface with industrial additive is accessibility to scanning and intuitive web. You know, we're not all designers, but in the future I'm sure we will be able to design. And we, we, we've been looking at this recently, the idea that do you actually have to have CAD interfaces to design things? Can you not design things use, using emotion or using words? Are there other ways that we could let consumers actually change and morph shape by letting consumers access that shape using other intuitive ways? I'm not going to go into it in too much depth, but I think in the future there will be other ways that we design things. And the other thing that we will see is more efficient networks. We will see different supply chains emerging um, using mixtures of localized or centralized manufacturing. So just some takeaways to wrap up on. Um, if you are engaged in, in, in consumer electronics, I suppose, does any of this, whether it's additive manufacturing or consumer 3D printing, does it present an opportunity? Or is there a threat? Is it disruptive or is it enabling? Do you need to think about a strategy in your company for additive or 3D printing or both? Because they are completely separate. Um, and the other thing to consider is the tech is moving. It's moving very quickly. So if it doesn't fit today, how are you going to make sure that the ideas you have converge with the technology when the technology is ready. So those are the things I would you know, leave this room with in the back of your mind and, and give some thought to.